Let's go live to Adelaide. Joining me is the South Australian Premier, Peter Malinowskis. Premier, thanks for your time. In your victory speech a few months ago, you said you were committed to a voice to Parliament, Indigenous voice to Parliament. We've seen uh, some developments federally. The Prime Minister this morning saying there's momentum, it needs to be acted upon this term, otherwise that momentum will be lost. How soon do you want a voice to the South Australian Parliament? How do you see it fitting in with the the federal plans, Premier? Well, firstly, Kieran, good morning. And I, I certainly welcome the federal Labor government's commitment to what I think is an important exercise that, by and large, the overwhelming majority of certainly the South Australian community and I think the Australian community support. We're progressing our plan to have a voice to Parliament at pace, Kieran. It's our objective to have legislation in the Parliament at some point during the course of the next calendar year. We've got a substantial piece of work that is currently being led here in South Australia, in, including by Aboriginal people, but also the Attorney General's Department, with our first ever Indigenous uh, initiated man who was Aboriginal, uh, who was the Attorney General. Uh, that work is in train. We anticipate that we can have a bill in the Parliament in the next calendar year. Obviously, we want that to work in conjunction with the Commonwealth's efforts. Uh, I think the Commonwealth's effort, of course, is the one that really captures the nation's attention. But we believe South Australia can be a leader in this regard, as we have been in many others, when it comes to substantial reform around the way parliaments operate in recognition of an inclusive um, but also incredibly diverse South Australian community. I, I know that you don't need a referendum for your changes in South Australia, right. but is there bipartisanship? Are you confident that a referendum nationally would get up from your perspective? Look, I'm confident of achieving bipartisan port here in South Australia. I'd be incredibly disappointed if that didn't occur. Uh, and, of course, we want to work with people to make sure that, at least here in the state's context when it comes to our legislation, uh, that we have the engagement and the lead-up so as to avoid any sort of political dispute. In terms of the referendum, uh, I think it will get up, yes. Um, of course, we know that is a substantial task when we look at the history of referendum across you know, the history of our federation. Uh, but I am very confident it will get up because I think, by and large, the Australian community support this proposition. And I think our, sorry, I think the Prime Minister uh, wants to make sure that the model is the right one, uh, that the South Australian, com so the Australian community can get behind, um, as, long, as well as Indigenous people who want to see this reform take place. The Prime Minister indicated this morning on another matter that he would have a COVID uh, Royal Commission. He said in his words, as soon as practicable. Do you welcome that? Well, I don't see a downside to it, Kieran. I mean, we know that at some point in the future, it's hard to know when, there's going to be another pandemic. And we know that the way the pandemic was held, um, handled did present challenges to our Federation. Um, it's presented very substantial challenges to families and businesses alike throughout the community. So I think a Royal Commission is a thoughtful proposition and one that is worthy of pursuit. Um, here in South Australia, we're not going to have a Royal Commission into it, but we are having a substantial review of the Emergency Management Act, which is something that we always thought should take place. We had a rather peculiar situation in South Australia where we had an emergency management declaration that lasted in effect two years. The longest one before that had been a matter of a week or two. Um, so we think there's a review that is required there. So we've got the, the appropriate coalescence between you know, police and emergency services doing their work, but also maintaining the, um, the important functions of a elected cabinet-led government. So getting that balance right is important at a state level, at a Commonwealth level, and if a Commonwealth chooses to have a Royal Commission to examine the way we govern ourselves in such a circumstance, I think that makes sense. I want to ask you about a couple of reforms in your state which have, have grabbed attention. First of all, the Autism Minister, um, a couple of decades yeah. ago, it was a relatively rare diagnosis, autism. Now you look at the NDIS, for those under 18, 55% of NDIS recipients have a, an autism diagnosis. So I guess there's a lot, there's greater awareness around that disability. Can you t explain the tipping point that informed your decision to appoint an Autism Minister? One of the benefits of a period in opposition, Kieran, is it gives you the, the opportunity to get out and engage in the community that sometimes government doesn't allow you to achieve because just because of time pressure, um, pressures and constraints. 
And everywhere I went, when I was out in the community over our period in opposition, I, I, I honestly couldn't go to a town hall forum, to the shopping centre, a street corner meeting, without a parent somewhere raising the frustrations they had because of their autistic child not getting support that they require, particularly in the school setting. So we set up autism forums and a range of other efforts to try and come up with a policy proposition to address those concerns. And it was just the overwhelming consistency of this being raised. I mean, during the week I went to a couple of primary schools and I went to one school um, classroom in Shadow Park here in South Australia in the sort of inner southern suburbs. And I went to the classroom and there were three children there that were autistic um, in the classroom um, needing extra support. So this is, this is prolific. Now, um, I'm not one to be able to provide a commentary or a thoughtful analysis around why we've seen this dramatic spike in the number of autism cases, but it is real. Parents are crying out for support. Um, there's been a lot of effort around our country to acknowledge people from minority groups uh, and a lot of awareness around it that's elevated the platform for reform in, for some minorities. But the neurodiverse community is huge. And I think there's been a largely silent response at at least a political policy level. And I guess we're trying to address that here in South Australia and we aspire to be a national leader in this regard because there are a lot of families out there, a lot of young people out there crying out for support. What would you say to parents uh, that might be concerned if their kids have got other disabilities that they might miss out on some of the focus if, if there is such a great focus specifically on autism? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and that feedback has come come through to us. I mean, I mean, naturally, we've still got all the resident government support and we've got a Minister for Disabilities here in South Australia who's been a passionate advocate in this area pretty much her mo most of her working life. So that effort is maintained. We just see a particular, particularly acute need with autism, principally because of the sheer volume of cases uh, without much attention. And that's why we thought it deserves a specific uh, person responsible for addressing it. It's a it's one of my assistant ministers. Um, she's passionate about young people's education. The other thing I'll, I'll just point out, Kieran, and this is, I think, worthy of some consciousness, where you have a child in a classroom uh, that has autism, or potentially two or three of them that are, are autistic, they require a lot more attention from the teacher so they can reach their potential, which is always substantial. But sometimes that withdraw that, you know, that pressure on the teacher takes them away from other students in the classroom which means nobody really wins. So um, this isn't just about help. Our policies, particularly in the education setting, aren't just about helping young people with autism. It's about making sure that everybody in the classroom gets the attention they require so they can fulfil their potential. So the fact that it doesn't just affect autistic people but everyone in our community, I think, demonstrates why this is worthy of a particular resource and a particular effort from government. Premier, I know on to another reform that you've announced in the campaign and now moving to deliver, you've had a lot of interest. I think 60 organisations I read um, internationally from Australia and around the globe wanting to be a part of the um, nearly $600 million hydrogen power plant. I'm really interested in how yeah. soon this is going to be up and running, particularly in the context of the recent energy crisis that we've experienced uh, certainly in the eastern states yep. with the gas shortages and so on. H how soon will this hydrogen plant be up and running? And will it take some of the pressure off the, the system that we're seeing strain so much in recent months? Uh, yes, it will take pressure off the system. It's not going to solve every problem in the system. And it will be up and running by the end of 2025. That's our commitment. I've got to say, Kieran, it, it, it is an ambitious policy and it's not without a degree of risk in, in a policy sense, but also in a technical sense. But everything that has happened since our election, uh, you know, four or five months ago, has actually given me even greater confidence that our ambitions are able to be realised, principally because of, you know, the international interest. You know, the most substantial industrial players globally have participated in this process. The biggest engineering houses in the world are providing feedback into the process and the, the advice that we're receiving is this can be done. Um, it's a big project. It's, like you said, $600 million worth of taxpayer funds. So we've got to make sure we get this right. In terms of the energy crisis that's playing out before our eyes and, you know, every Australian is paying for it, I think it's a demonstration of 
you know, the biggest public policy failure in a generation. Um, and it's incredibly unfortunate. And, you know, we've discussed this before and I know that your program has covered this issue extensively, but I mean, how we can have a situation as an energy exporter as a country, one of the most energy rich places anywhere in the world, of having such a dramatic shortage is a, I think is a national disgrace. Um, we believe here in South Australia and the South Australian government that gas has a role to play um, in getting that transition right, but we also believe hydrogen will have a very big role to play in the not too distant future. We want to be a leader in this regard. We've got some natural advantages on our side in South Australia because of the um, coalescence of wind and solar resources in a way that we don't see anywhere else in the country. In fact, not many other places in the world. So this is an opportunity we want to grab. We want to be a leader in it. We want to work with the private sector in it and we're going to get it done. OK, well, that is um, one major initiative to a, another one, which I guess might inform it to a, to a degree, and that is the merger of two of your big universities in South Australia. I know this is a, a big education focus of yours. Why are you doing this, and what do you see as the, the benefits here? OK, so in South Australia, we always used to have a top 100 university, and it's now been a substantial period of time where we haven't. And that is at the expense of a few things, um, Kieran. But the one that worries me the most is the quantum of dollars when it comes to research and development funding here in, um, in our universities, which are world leading. There's been a lot of talk, um, a lot of analysis, pretty much for the last 25 years, Kieran, in South Australia, about um, does South Australia really need three universities? And if there was an amalgamation of two of them, would that provide an economies of scale that would attract more research investment, um, more international students and more money coming into what are you know, incredibly important economic institutions, let alone educational institutions in our state. Mm. Now, there have been various iterations um, of the you know, discussions between universities, but governments always had a hands-off approach, which is something that you know, on one level makes a, a bit of sense, except for the fact that this is about the state's long-term future. And I don't want to lead a government which just allows opportunities to slip us by because there are disagreements at, at a university level that are um, the sort of complications that come in any amalgamation um, and it all falls apart despite a collective view that this is in the state's interest. So that's why we're playing a role. Um, I'm very pleased with the fact that there are highly productive discussions happening within the university sector in South Australia. Um, this is again to be frank, Kieran, a risky policy. Most other governments have, have squibbed it in the past of both political persuasions, but you know, our assessment is, and a lot of academy, look at our academia's assessment is, is this is a necessary reform yeah. focused on the long term of our state, and that's why we're pursuing it. OK, and uh, finally, I've got to ask you, we, we had a major electric vehicle summit in Canberra on Friday, some big names in attendance. You've, you've previously promised to scrap the tax on EVs. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, are, you, are you still committed right. to that? And, and, and when will it be removed? Uh, legislation's in the Parliament, Kieran, so it'll be done within uh, weeks. I mean, Parliament resumes for the midwinter break shortly, but we just don't think now is the time to be placing a tax on electric vehicles. I mean, in fact, to be honest, I, I think it's crazy. Um, and of course, this is the state imposing a tax on electric vehicle, and the supposed justification for this in a policy sense is, well, the Commonwealth is going to lose fuel excise as people move to take the shift onto EVs. Well, quite frankly, that's the Commonwealth's problem. I mean, I don't know why it's the state's responsibility to impose a, impose a tax on, a, on an investment that we're trying to encourage households and businesses to make, um, because the Commonwealth um, has got a structural problem in terms of the fuel excise. I, I don't see how that really stacks up. So we think it was a mistake from the former government. We railed against it at the time. And if you're going to do that in opposition, you've got to be willing to act on it if, you, if you've got the opportunity in government. And, and that's why we'll be legislating against it. And I, I hope the upper house here in South Australia supports that. South Australian Premier Peter Malinowskis, appreciate your time early this Sunday. Thanks. No worries, Kieran. I appreciate it, mate. Cheers.